and an explosive display from a group of friends who go barnstorming in biplanes. Three-dimensional freedom. There's no way you can get that sensation doing anything when your feet are on the ground. The Tiger Moth, the so-called trainer of the empire, and the firm favourite with a group of biplane enthusiasts who operate from a homemade airstrip at Baxterley in central England. Its owner, Ken Broomfield, loves its sheer simplicity. There's no gizmos and electronics inside to look at. It's just a matter of looking where you're going. And um, if it feels right, it normally is right. About 8,500 moths were made. And mine, like um, 3,500 others, was built at Morris Motors at Cowley. The, the price started quite high, about three or four hundred pounds, but eventually it settled at about fifty pounds per aeroplane. And uh, if you wanted to buy an, pay an extra fiver, you've got a brand new engine as a spare in the box, ready to go. And of course that really started up all the um, flying clubs after the war. They couldn't afford to buy new aeroplanes, so all the flying clubs started back up with Tiger Moths, and, and they lasted for a good twenty years in that stage. Of course afterwards, in the sixties, they got a bit old hat. American imports came in, so really they went to the back of the hangar. When they were damaged, they were probably just left or burnt. Uh, but of course now they're becoming rare and people are rebuilding. They're finding the old bits and pieces at the back of hangars and trying to get aeroplanes back into the air. And of course there's about 60 or 70 flying in England now. The Tiger Moth really is a development of the DH-60 Moth, uh, built by de Havilland's. Uh, what happened, the, the RAF were keen to buy them for training pilots, but they were not too happy with the clutter near the front cockpit, which meant that the instructor couldn't get out in an emergency to parachute to safety. So de Havilland's wheeled one into a shed somewhere and chopped it about a little bit and moved the whole centre section forward, which then enabled the, the uh, front occupant to be able to step out onto the wing and jump off quickly in case of an emergency. This isn't an emergency, it's Sam, one of Ken's pals who regularly takes to the skies in the moth's front passenger seat and then in true barnstorming fashion jumps out. It's part of an aerial display being developed by Ken and the other biplane enthusiasts who drop in most weekends. The, the Tiger Moth is constructed from um, steel framework with uh, a fabric covering. Nowadays it could be seconite, which is polyester. Uh, the traditional covering was cotton or Irish linen. The advantages are, of course, that if there's any damage, it can be easily repaired by just sticking another patch on, re-doping, and away you go. The disadvantage, of course, is that it only lasts about 10 years. So. When that period is up, we have to strip all the old fabric off, check the internal in structures of the aeroplane, and, and recover. These devices on the back are called anti-spin strakes, and they were developed by Sir Francis Chichester to, uh, to help the aeroplane get out of a spin. Well, I started off on a modern aeroplane, and the problem is, once you've got your license, you jump in the aeroplane and think, well, where can I go? And normally it's to another airfield where you, you go and have a cup of coffee, and that's about it. I didn't really know about this private strip flying. It's a lot more informal, a lot more enjoyable. I haven't got the, the aids like air traffic control and radar to bring you in, so you have to find out where you are, make up your own decisions about landing on short strips, and it really is a different type of flying. Ken enjoyed it so much he built his own airstrip in the field behind his house. It's become base for a whole range of biplanes and their owners. And at the moment you can see we've got a full set of, uh, of biplanes most of which are red. It's really the friendliness of a private field. Um, we're all of like-minded uh, pilots. We're all into biplanes, as you can see. There's definitely some glamour about a biplane. When you see them in flight, they always look a lot more pretty than a lot of the modern metal aircraft that are, are flying around. There's nothing to beat on a lazy summer's afternoon, just rolling around 
completely three-dimensional freedom. You can go absolutely anywhere you want, up, down, left, right, in a total sphere. And th there's no way you can get that sensation doing anything when your feet are on the ground. I'd always wanted to fly biplanes after flying with Ken for quite a few years and falling in love with two sets of wings instead of one and just decided that I'd have to go and learn to fly and uh, when I did I was in a lucky position to be able to purchase the Acro Sport and position it here at Baxterley which is uh, an idyllic beautiful grass airfield. The aircraft I'm flying at the moment is uh, an SE-5A uh, which uh, is a World War One. That particular aircraft there is a replica it's seven-eighth scale. The original was built in 1916-1917 and was one of the very prolific World War One fighters in comparison to the Spitfire in the Second World War. That's a Hatz CB-1. It's actually an American home built. It was designed in America, built in America over a period of about seven years. Every part on that aircraft was, was handcrafted by one person. Classic look to it. It looks like a bit of a Waco, 1930s style. Uh, just what I was looking for, so we brought it back to Baxterley. This ex-army helicopter, also based at Baxterley, gives a clue to another of Ken's passions, military vehicles. Well, the, the Ferris is something we bought to, uh, to go to military vehicle shows, but recently we've, we've also used that to enhance the little air displays and shows that we have here, using it as a centrepiece for uh, battles and attacks by aeroplane. Well, I've been to one or two of the barnstorming events where they do flower bombing and the flower bags bursting on the ground weren't particularly impressive and uh, as a friend of mine Jim and myself had been on uh, firing courses for a local firework company we got expertise in fusing and, and setting off various sorts of charges. We decided we'd use some and develop them to make uh, a more spectacular barnstorming effect. If we put some of the, uh, the boarding underneath for safety, yeah. we have charges which are in front of the vehicle which will give a direct hit when the time comes and some a little bit long because Ken's bombing at times is not particularly accurate so we have to give him a little bit of leeway. But we do give him at the end the most important thing which is a direct hit. Mm -hmm. 